Good evening. Good. I think you're out there. You look like you're out there. Good evening. All right, much better. Um, first of all, I would just want to say I'm very pleased to be here. Um, Travis uh, was a student in one of my courses, and it's a great honor for me uh, to see uh, former students go on to do great things. And I consider organizing this type of an event on this type of topic to be a great thing. And it's neat for me to be able to participate. Thank you for including me. I'm thankful for all of you who, are, who came out to hear the different perspectives on this topic of affirmative action. I would start by saying that I think uh, modern day affirmative action programs are debated. The reason why we're having this debate, we're here today, is because our country, the United States of America, does not provide everyone who's seeking education, employment, housing, or whatever valued resource with an opportunity to obtain it. That is, there's a competition for these valued resources. And it's because of that competition for education, for employment, etc., that we're debating whether or not affirmative action should be taken to ensure the inclusion of people from groups that historically have been denied access from those educational and employment opportunities in the United States of America. So I think that's why we're having this topic. Without that, if there weren't that competition for scarce resources, jobs and educational spots, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Affirmative action would be a moot point that we were doing that kind of outreach. Let's start with a historical review. From the mid-1600s to the 1960s, the country's economy was openly run as a racist system. Used black labor, used Native American and Mexican lands, and the use of that labor and those lands of others, of people of color, to create resources and prosperity for whites. Historically, whites have also been the direct beneficiaries of much government assistance. And we could look at a variety of things. This slide I don't expect you to be able to see because it's, uh, it's such a small font. I have a, another slide right after it, but I just wanted to show you the timeline from the colonial period up through modern period of different government boosts and blocks to upward economic mobility for people, for different people. And these acts start way in the far left corner in the 1600s of colonies providing significant land grants to white colonists that were unavailable to those who were enslaved. Right? The Homestead Act of the 1860s Right? The Homestead Acts of the 1860s that provided land grants to white European families wishing to farm. 160 to 320 acres. That's a significant plot of land, if you know how much an acre is. Social Security. The Federal Housing Administration. We're going to talk about the FHA in a moment. And other related programs of the 1930s New Deal by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and that Congress. All of those kinds of government assistance created more white prosperity and upward mobility, not only for the white generation of that time, but for their descendants throughout the, the centuries. These affirmative action programs for whites have long provided a substantial basis for economic prosperity and mobility. The resistance to affirmative action programs didn't occur then. It occurred more recently when, based on Civil Rights Act of 1954, affirmative action became a policy to encourage equal opportunity, to level the playing field for groups of people who had been and are discriminated against, including people of color and women. Affirmative action policies in hiring, college admissions, the awarding of government contracts went further than just a simple ban on discrimination. So it wasn't enough for government to just say you can't discriminate. They actually adopted affirmative action programs that said 
you must take affirmative action to outreach and include those groups that have been historically denied in the past. The resistance to these more recent affirmative action programs occurs within that economic context of dis diminishing economic opportunities. And it's important for us to understand the context of this debate that we're having. So we can look more specifically at the Homestead Act between the 1860s and the 1930s. Gave away 246 million acres of land that once belonged to Native Americans and Mexican American, Mexicans of the South and Southwest. Those lands in Midwestern and Western areas were given out to European families wishing to farm. African Americans were generally excluded from access to that land because they were enslaved or during the Jim Crow era because they were locked into near slavery, debt peonage, and the like. 246 million acres of land. In the 1930s, New Deal programs provided aid to white farmers, bankers, business executives, enabling them to survive the Great Depression and thrive during uh, World, World War, uh, post-war years. And the white descendants of those have benefited greatly to the present day. Some major programs like Social Security initially excluded lower paid categories of workers where many black Americans and other Americans of color worked. Most people don't learn that early on Social Security excluded household workers and farm workers. And who were those occupations? But perhaps the best example of European ethnic benefit and gain of the full benefit of whiteness to the exclusion of others comes through an innovation in housing, which is where most families draw their wealth. At the end of World War II, the Federal Housing Administration created in the 1930s racialized housing, wealth, and opportunity for decades and for generations in few ways that we could have imagined. It was a time when hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families but had no place to live. The Federal Housing Administration became one of the most important subsidy programs and it was predominantly a white subsidy program that was later boosted by veterans housing programs, the VA loans. That enabled millions of whites to buy their first homes. What is the FHA? FHA is a government administration. It provided loans or it insured long-term, low monthly pay payment mortgage loans so that average Americans, including these GIs fresh back from World War II, could purchase a home. Home ownership was made possible for millions of families and it generated a tremendous volume of housing construction. Now, what, what was the case before the 1930s? Before the 1930s, you had to pay 50% of the home value down, up front. That's not what we do today. And that's because of the Fresno, uh, Federal Housing Authority. Fresno, uh, Federal Housing Administration allowed for a family to put 10% or 20% down and finance the other 80 to 90% over a long period of time at a low interest rate. And that greatly expanded home ownership, which greatly expanded the middle class, which greatly expanded the wealth of families, providing for the generations that come after those homeowners whose educations are financed, whose entrepreneurial ventures are financed by the home equity that's been built up over those times. So the average person could now own a home. Between 1934 and 1962, the federal government underwrote $120 billion in new housing. Less than 2% of that went to non-whites. Less than 2% of the federal government's underwriting of $120 billion in new housing went, went to non-whites between 1934 and 1962. Ira Katzelson, the red book that I have there, Daniel, if you could 
pick that up there. That, that, uh, that book by Ira Katzlitzen, 2005, describes the era of aggressive public assistance programs from the 1930s to the 1960s as a time when affirmative action was white. And people were not screaming out, oh, this is unfair, right? Decades of that discrimination have resulted in huge inequality. So let's look at the data on economic inequality along racial lines. First, we need to distinguish between income, right, and wealth. Income, thought more of wages, right, that money received over some period of time. It includes your wages, your salary, right, that sort of thing. Your wealth refers to your assets. Right, your assets, the things that you own. And I have some examples of that. So take a look here. You have some examples of income on the left. Savings account interest, stock dividends, capital gains, rental income, government benefits, wages. But the assets are the stocks themselves, the bonds themselves, the home you own, the, the car you own, the jewelry, the business, those kinds of things. If we look at median income, Along racial lines, we see um, inequality over time. 1959 to 2011, the top line is Asian. This is the median income for families by race and Hispanic origin. Second highest you see is white, not Hispanic. Third line is the all races. Fourth line is the Hispanic of any race, and the last line at the bottom, significantly lower than the top line, right, is of African Americans. This is income. The percentage of Americans in poverty remains high, but black Americans have nearly double the rate of poverty as Americans as a whole. 15% for Americans as a whole, about 27.5% for African Americans. White Americans, about 9.8%. So African Americans, three times the rate of poverty. Double the rate of unemployment. Significantly higher rates of underemployment. Workers who can only find part-time work or make very low wages, right? So income. Let's look at wealth because wealth is more drastic. Just if you thought that was bad. Uh, to really glimpse at the far-reaching consequences of racial inequality, we really should be looking at wealth. Another way to measure wealth is net worth. Your right, assets minus your debts. Because you, um, you could have high income but low wealth. You're making $110,000 a year. Let's say you're a, a dean or a vice president maybe at, at Fresno State, you're making over 100,000, 110, 120, 130,000 a year, right? And you only spend 100,000. That income minus your debt, minus your expenses is your, is, your, is your wealth, your total net worth, right? And so you have a plus there. You could have though a high, high income and have no wealth, no, no net worth. If you're spending more than you're taking in, right, you may have a negative net, net worth. So today, if we look at families, median household wealth by race and ethnicity, and this is uh, one source by Wolf, this is the median household wealth. Median means 50% are above and 50% are below. And you can see it's about 10 times higher for the average white family than for the average black family. Another measure of wealth, this is the mean of wealth. The mean wealth would be the average, right? You take them all together, you add them up, you divide by the number, and you have the average. So this is even, even more stark in terms of the, the amount. Today, the average black family has about one-eighth of the net worth or assets of the average white family. And that difference has grown since the 1960s, not decreased. And it's not explained by other factors, like education, like savings rates, 
like your wages or earning rates. It's really the legacy of systemic racism built into the Federal Housing Administration and other programs of the past, affirmative action programs of the past that benefited whites. No other measure really captures the legacy, that, that cumulative disadvantage of race, right, than net worth or wealth. Even with the same income, white families and black families that make the same income, those white families on average have twice the wealth of those black families with that same income. Much of that difference lies in the value of their homes. What happens when we compare families along the color line who have similar mouth, similar wealth? When you make the right comparison, when you compare a black child from a family with the same income and the same wealth as the white child from the same economic situation, rates of college graduation are the same, rates of employment are the same, work hours and wages are the same, similar rates of welfare usage. So when we're talking about race in terms of a cultural accounting of that economic differences, right, we understand that there's a leveling that happens. But that income and wealth disadvantage are a result of decades of systemic racism. Perhaps the best uh, thing might be to do, since race is such a hot button and polarizing topic, even in 2014 in the United States, perhaps rather than basing affirmative action on race, such a polarizing uh, aspect of, of human difference, Perhaps we, we might consider basing affirmative action on income and wealth. Maybe that would make this policy less of a hot button, divisive, and contested issue while addressing both historical and contemporary lack of opportunities from people of color and those from lower social class backgrounds. Thank you, I hope to address more during our Q&A period.